ask you to turn in your Bible tonight, please, to Romans chapter 1. I am sure that I am not the only one that uh, is deeply concerned about what's happening here, not only in our city, but in our, in our country. I've been thinking about that and uh, been pondering that. Obviously, we addressed that when we had our day of prayer and fasting a couple of weeks ago. But I've been thinking uh, about that even more so. And uh, it really all comes down to the fact that we're in the condition that we're in because we as a people have rejected the Lord. And when that happens, evil engulfs and chaos reigns. In fact, when a people reject God, they may not even realize, but they're signing their own death warrant. They're bringing God's destruction upon them. And it is, it's a destruction from within. It's a, an implosion that happens from the inside. That's what the second half of Romans chapter 1 is about. So I've had you turn there, and I'd like to pick up and uh, read a few verses that really, I think, mirrors our current conditions here in this country. Begin in verse 18 of Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth, literally hold the truth down in, right, in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest, is revealed in them. For God hath shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him of God from the creation of, of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let me just say, no person, no city, no country it has any excuse for not knowing God. It's a deliberate rejection, and that's what we see as we continue reading in this passage. But before we go any further, let's pause a moment for prayer. Heavenly Father, just so thankful tonight that the Bible has all the answers that we need. And we thank you for this revealing that you give us in this passage and others like it. And I pray that you'll use it tonight to show us and to teach us and also to help us because, Lord, we are in a desperate place. So I pray that you would get glory to your name. Use your word as you see fit to accomplish the purpose for which you sent it that it would not return to you void, as you said. Lord, we're looking to you tonight. Keep us focused. Get glory to your name, in which we pray it all. Amen. So I'm thinking about the current situation that we are in, that I say really mirrors the second half of Romans chapter 1. And in the uh, verses... 18 to 23, we see the cause of the condition. I've already read uh, uh, the first couple of verses. Let's pick up in verse 21. Because that, here's why they're not uh, there without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain, empty, futile in their imaginations and their thoughts and their foolish heart was darkened and professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible god into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things the mess that we're in is self-inflicted we've really We've been in the process for many years now of committing national suicide. 
And here in the 18th through the 20th verse, we see the first cause, and that is suppression. He, it says that we hold the truth in unrighteousness. We suppress the truth. We don't want the truth. We take the truth of God's word and we reject it. And so, as a result of that, God is angry towards the rejection of his revelation to us, of his truth that he has so freely given to us. That's what verse 18 says. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against this kind of thing, of pushing away and covering up and holding down and suppressing the truth that God has shown us in his word about sin. Not only that, in the verses we read, verse 21 and 22, there is there not only a suppression, but there's imagination going on. He says in that, uh, uh, in, in that uh, 21st verse, they became vain in their imaginations. That is, they refuse to worship God, they refuse to be grateful to God because they don't recognize him, and they came up with their own foolish ideas, vain in their imaginations. Give you a prime example of that. We as a country in our public education system from elementary school all the way up through graduate school have latched on to the evolution theory and we've thrown out creation. That is a prime example of vain imaginations. That's the foolish ideas that have been embraced when you reject God, you reject creation. You reject the creator, so you reject his creation. And as a result, you have to have a substitute, and that is, of course, evolution. What else is the cause of this? Well, in verses 23 and also verse 25, verse 23 talks about, really, substitution. Look at it. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto, and he named some examples, and in verse 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie and served the, create, the, the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. What's the cause of the current situation that we're in? It is because of the suppression of the truth it is because of the imaginations of our foolish ideas, and it is because of the substitution in which the worship of God is replaced with idolatry. And one of the biggest culprits, as far as idols that have replaced God in our nation, is what could be termed secular humanism, where man is the measure of everything where man is God, where everything revolves around him, where man is in charge of everything and everything that has to do has to do with him. Uh, secular humanism is a substitution for the worship of the true God. Well, what are the consequences of this? If this is the cause of our current situation, what are the consequences? Well, let's read verse 24. It says, for uh, uh, this cause, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, what we are going to see in the next few verses, the consequences that uh, result from the suppression, the imagination, and the substitution for the true and living God is really a form of God's judgment upon a people. We, whether you recognize it or not, are suffering the judgment of God as New Yorkers and as Americans. We're suffering the passive judgment of God. I mean, God has abandoned us 
to do what we want to do, to do what is right in our own eyes. That's God's judgment. When God lets people do what they want to do, that's the passive judgment of God on a people. And that's where we're at. It's like the book of Judges. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's a, that's a, that's a, a pattern for modern America. That's the consequences of rejecting God. And I want you to see in verse 24 that the consequences are evident in what I would say, verse 24 is just talking about immorality. In the 1960s and in the 1970s, we had what was called a sexual revolution. And it was in the early 1970s that the Supreme Court of the United States of America approved abortion. And as a result of that, there became the legalization of the murder of totally helpless, innocent life. That is all in that 24th verse. It is immorality that is the consequence of rejecting God. But look at uh, verse 26. For this cause, notice the term again, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, verse 27, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men, working, uh, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. In verse 24, the first consequence is immorality. In verse 26 and 27, the second consequence is homosexuality. And in the 1980s and the 1990s, that was the decades of coming out, where people came out of the closet, so to speak, and they boldly proclaimed themselves to be homosexuals and took pride in it. And it became more and more acceptable in, uh, in our society. And uh, it even became supported through anti-discrimination laws as well. This is the consequences of a rejection of God in a city, in a nation, in society. Immorality, verse 24. Homosexuality, verse 26. Look with me in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their thoughts, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I say that this reprobate mind is a mind that God completely disapproves of. That's actually what the word means but it refers to what we would call insanity. And we have gone from immorality to homosexuality to what is today insanity. From 2000, the year 2000 to the present, we have made some insane decisions. Same-sex marriage, the marriage of two women and two men, called marriage, that's absolute insanity. Another example of this insanity would be what is today called gender fluidity or dysphoria, where people don't know what they are. That there, I've heard that there are over a hundred genders that you could possibly choose from. That is absolutely insane. Insane. That is insanity. That's where we are in our country, and that is the consequences of rejecting God. And now we are in a place in our country of such insanity that we are suffering total anarchy. You realize that uh, our cities, they're not reporting it on the news because it's not to, uh, I guess it doesn't uh, fit their agenda, but our cities are on fire. The city of Portland has had uh, over 50 some days of rioting and our cities are just being destroyed by total anarchy. 
and uh, the, this insanity of get rid of the police force. That is total insanity if I've ever seen it. What are we going to do if we don't? Who are we going to call on uh, to protect us if there is no police force anymore? Proverbs 28, 19 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Another way of saying that is where there is no divine guidance, people are left to their own destructive ways. And that's what we're, that's the consequence of rejecting God. God has abandoned this nation to its insanity and lives are becoming full of all kinds of wickedness. He goes on to explain in the verses that follow verse 28 that uh, we have even become inventors of evil. We have even uh, come up with new ways to sin, if you will. In the 1930s, there was a movie made called Mutiny on the Bounty. And that movie tells the true story of a famous mutiny in 1789 on a British ship called the HMS Bounty, and it was a mutiny against the captain, William Bly. Well, if I can just use that as a basis to paint a picture, an illustration of what's happening, what the consequence, where we're at as a city and a nation, I would say, think of this. Imagine that you're a passenger on an airliner that is hijacked, and that airliner has been by the hijackers turned around in the opposite direction to a new destination, and the passengers are promised by the hijackers that they are going to be brought to a superior destination, and when they get there, they're going to be guaranteed all kinds of freedom. And all the passengers on board are completely duped by the hijackers. They believe them and so they support their plan. We live in a world that has been hijacked. We live in a nation and a city that has been hijacked by evil forces. You see, God has designed from the beginning that human beings would be his regents ruling this earth. But when Adam and Eve sinned, Satan stepped in and usurped that power to rule this earth. And Satan and his forces are, are luring mankind through the pleasures that they offer, through the possessions that they can give them, and through the power that they can put in their hands. And so Satan rules this planet through lost mankind that he has duped by offering pleasures and possessions and power. And so the world has turned from following God to following the devil's plan for personal gain that they might get. You say, wow, that's a horrible picture. Romans 1 is a horrible picture. But I have to admit, folks, that's where we're at as a nation. We are a nation that are in this situation, this current situation, because we have kicked God out of America. We kicked God out of the schools. We've kicked God out of public life. And look at the chaos and the destruction that has come to fill the ranks. You say, is there any hope? What's to be the Christian's response to this? Well, I'm telling you, the Christian is the only solution. The current situation, the Christian is the solution. What is the biblical response of the believer? Well, I could show you from the rest of the book of Romans what the believer's response ought to be, and perhaps I should do that. And I think the first response is what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The believer's biblical response, the Christian solution is a surrendered life. 
It begins with a surrendered life. And that surrendered life is based upon the mercies of God to you. Has God been merciful to you? Oh, yes, he has. Have you ever taken advantage of the mercy of God and received his great salvation through Jesus who paid your whole sin debt on that cross? Have you ever repented and trusted Jesus as your Savior? Then based upon the mercies of God that makes you a believer and gives you forgiveness of sin for all eternity, you are to maintain that through a surrendered life that is constantly renewed by a, a, a mindset that comes from the Bible, a biblical way of thinking. Let me warn you, if you haven't figured it out already, if you haven't experienced it already, the news and the views that we get on a daily basis drag us down and they suck the very joy and life out of our soul. If your mind has become a trash can for all the world's problems, it's anger, it's gossip, it's pain, it's suffering, it's rage, it's destruction, you'll become an out of control garbage dump. And you are taking in too much of the world's garbage to function. A surrendered life is a renewed mind on a daily basis. That's the secret of it. That means you reject that stuff and you spend your time with God as much as possible. What's a, what's a Christian solution? Well, the second biblical response in the book of Romans is not only a surrendered life, but it's a spirit-filled life. Chapter 6, 7, and 8. In chapter 6, we are told that when Jesus died on the cross, we who are believers died with him to sin. We died to the power that sin had in domination of our lives. We died with Christ. That's only half of the story. The other half of the story is that when he rose from the dead, we rose with him in a new life. A new life that is set free from the power and domination of sin. In chapter 7 of Romans, we get a picture of someone who doesn't know how to access that freedom and that power of the resurrection of the life of Christ in their life. But when you get to chapter 8, it becomes very clear that the way that we access that freedom, freedom not to sin, a freedom not to sin, uh, not freedom to do whatever you want, but a freedom to not sin. That's what we have in Christ, according to Romans 6, 7, and 8. And we access that by the residence of God himself in us, in the person of his Holy Spirit, the spirit of life, the spirit of the law of life in Christ Jesus makes us free, sets us free, liberates us from the spirit of sin and death. So the, the Christian solution to the current situation is not only a surrendered life, but a spirit-filled life. And if we continue on in Romans, if you go back to chapter 1 for a moment, in verses 14 uh, to 17, Paul is anticipating coming to the epicenter of that filthy, immoral, homosexual, uh, uh, insane world. Rome. And here's what he says. He says in the 14th verse, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What is the Christian solution to the current situation? It is a soul-winning life. By that I mean, give the gospel to people. Look, if there would have been no hope in that Roman society, 
God would have never, never sent Paul and his mission team to evangelize the wicked Greco-Roman world. But what we read in the book of Acts is that these early believers are accused of turning the world upside down. They turn the pagan world upside down. And I submit to you that God wants to do the same thing now as he did then. If there was no hope for Rome, he would not have sent evangelists to Rome. If there's no hope for this city and for this nation, he would send no evangelists to this city or to this nation. What we need is not only a surrendered life and a spirit-filled life, but a soul-winning life. The gospel, uh, God, the gospel is still the only answer. And it is the power of God at work to save. I came across a song that uh, I listened to, and I wanted to at least share the lyrics with you. And the title of the song is still called, It's Still the Cross. Now, I want you to listen carefully to the words, because it, it hits the nail on the head that the answer is the gospel. The answer is soul winning. The answer is preaching the gospel to our city and to this country. Verse 1. It's not conservative or liberal, however they're defined. It's not about interpretation or the judgment of the mind. It's the opposite of politics, power, or prestige. It's about a simple message and whether we believe. It's still the cross. It's still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captive free. It's still the name, the name of Jesus, that has power to save the lost. It's still the cross. Verse 2. Now, we can water down theology and preach the word to suit our needs. We can justify sweet, subtle lies that are wrapped in noble deeds. We can alter our convictions to adapt to social whims, but we cannot change the gospel or the truth contained within. It's still the cross. It's still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captive free. It's still the name, the name of Jesus, that has power to save the lost. It's still the cross. Third verse. Though some may say it's man's religion or ancient history, the cross of Jesus still remains the price for sin that sets us free. And the chorus uh, would uh, go on again. Point well taken. It's still the cross. The message hasn't changed. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And then uh, the fourth and final thing in the book of Romans that I wanted to share with you, the Christian solution to the current situation, what the biblical role is for us according to Romans, having read chapter 1, the second half, and that is not only a surrendered life, not only a spirit-filled life, not only a soul-winning life, but finally, what I would call a spiritual awakened life. And I think of uh, Romans chapter 12, when I think of that, where he talks about authentic Christianity. And uh, he, he says, let your love be without hypocrisy. Hate that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Do you hate evil? Or do you tiptoe around the tulips when it comes to evil. Do you hate evil or do you flirt with it? Hate evil, cling to, be glued, be cemented to good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor putting others before yourself. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, patient in trial, continuing instant or devoted constantly in prayer. I could go on and finish out that 12th chapter, but I think you get the idea. It's a people that are spiritually awakened. It's a people that are seeking God's presence for personal revival. Do you believe what James says? He says, look, if you'll draw near to God, don't think for a moment that he won't draw near to you. You want God near you? Then take a step in his direction. 
and he promises he'll draw near to you. We need to seek God's reviving presence. And then we need to pray for uh, our society to be spiritually awakened, for the Holy Spirit of God to sweep through in a great outpouring in this city and this nation. We need to be those Abrams that intercede on the behalf of Sodom. We live in a Sodom of a city. We need to be uh, those Jonas that will stand in Nineveh and declare the word of God so that Nineveh would repent and turn to the living God. We're to be those believers that are willing to endure hardness as a good soldier, that are willing to deny themselves, die to themselves, and take up the cross and follow the Savior, whatever the cost might be, and not worry about protecting our lives, not counting our lives dear unto ourselves, but following him at all costs. Although the apathy of some Christians and the wickedness of society are so discouraging, we ought, to pre we ought to pray and remain confident. Let me give you an example from history. William Wilberforce was a great Christian philanthropist, and he was a vigorous opponent of slavery in England during the early 1800s. And as he surveyed the terrible moral and spiritual climate of his day, he didn't lose hope. Here's what he wrote, I quote, My own solid hopes for the well-being of my country depend not so much on her navies or her armies, nor on the wisdom of her rulers, nor on the spirit of her people, as on the persuasion that she still contains many who love and obey the gospel of Christ. I believe their prayers may yet prevail, unquote. And I should say that within a few years, he made this statement that the country he loved had experienced one of the greatest revivals in modern times and brought advances, brought salvation of thousands, and produced widespread social change. I think J. Edwin Orr, summarized it in one sentence. He was a great uh, revivalist. J. Edwin Orr said, uh, over his 60 years of study of prayer, uh, of revival, he said, prayer and spiritual awakening, he, he said, whenever God is ready to do something new with his people, he always sets them to praying. I wonder if that's why some of us have been impressed to pray. Whenever God sets to do something new among his people, he always causes them to pray. That's what we're here to do tonight. I want to leave you with that hope. The current situation looks hopeless, but there's a Christian solution, and the solution is Christians. And it's Christians that will live a surrendered life a spirit-filled life, a soul-winning life, a spiritually awakened life. Our Heavenly Father, I ask that you might continue to cause us to ponder this. And if we've been discouraged as is, as is natural, I pray that we take heart tonight by seeking your presence and calling upon you in prayer, both for ourselves as well as for our, uh, our, the inhabitants of the city and our countrymen. We ask it in Jesus' name.